Good morning, everybody. I don't know why I'm in such a big room. And maybe maybe it's because my band from Nashville is coming out to join me. <laughs> so as you see, I am from Nashville, Tennessee. I am a professor in the School of Occupational Therapy in Nashville, Tennessee, at Belmont University.、Uh, you may know Belmont University as a music school, so I have no musical talent. So they keep me on the other side of campus. So what I'd like to talk about today is cognition. Okay. And before we get started, I do want to、um, uh, do want to inform you that I have no disclosures. I paid for the conference myself,、um, and it's just me and some things I know about cognition. So, as I said, I am a professor. The, the courses I teach are assistive technology, research, and an advanced practice course called Cogni- cognition, vision, and perception. And I've always had an interest in this. And so, one of the things that、um, I really wanted to do was. Um, have a cor- have a topic here at at ISS about what is cognition, and so as you can see from the objectives, we're going to talk about the different domains of cognition. We're going to compare and critique some of the definitions and of the cognitive domains, and then really talk about what cogn- cognitive domains are relevant to power and mobility. So, this is a question I looked up in research, and so this I have a few references here, but. The references are not all exhaustive, so the, when you look for a research article, research topic, you start with a question. So my question was, what cognitive skills are necessary for powered mobility? And this is just a word、uh, cloud that shows you some of the responses. And one of the most you see is good cognitive skill. So let's talk about what cognition is, and you'll see there's lots of other ones: problem solving, cause and effect, and things like this. So what is cognition? It is the potential for skills that are present at birth. So I'll give you a couple really take-home points I want to、um, re- really want to stress, and that is that an infant is born with cognition, because an infant is born with reflexes, and those reflexes lead to action. And so every reflex a child has just needs. Opportunities to use, and those are the things that become re- the become cognition. So, for instance, if you think about cause and effect, right?、Uh, a baby is hungry. The baby knows where the nipple is or the bottle. They cry. They get the bottle and they stop crying. That's cause and effect. That comes at birth. And so, if we say, well, the the child has to demonstrate cause and effect for power and mobility.、Mm. Uh, not really, right? Because you can see that it's a, a something present at birth. Many people say, and, and I agree, that memory is really a part of cognition. So let's say you learn one skill, you store that skill in your in your memory bank, and then you use that same skill again. And so me- memory is part of that. So what leads to memory? Anybody? I teach in school, so people usually answer me, but you don't have to. So you won't. So what leads what leads to memory? Repetition, right? So the more a child or person has the opportunity to use a skill, even if it starts as reflex, then that stores in the memory. So it needs repetition.、Uh, other people say speed is a, a portion, a part of cognition. So speed is how frequently can you use that skill repeatedly. We also know that attention is part of Cognition, right? You have to be able to selectively attend, and I'll talk about some of the attention skills. And then, one of the most basic things associated with cognition is visual fixation. Not, not to say that children born blind don't have cognitive skills; they have workarounds. But visual fixation—the ability to look from at one stationary object, take that stationary object in for ten seconds. Puts that information into your storage system, right? So visual fixation—the ability to use two eyes, mono- binocular vision—the ability to use two eyes to look at a a object. So I can use my visual fixation to tell you that this is a black box. It has a green arrow. It has a red arrow. But if I didn't have visual fixation—in in other words, the ability to use bi- binocular vision to see this. Can I really tell what it is? No. 
So the precursor to visual fixation, just like every other skill of our body, is you have to have proximal stability to have distal st stability, right? You have to have the ability to sit up straight, have your head straight, to have your eyes straight to take in that information. So that's the foundation to cognitive skills. So a lot of people, oh, I'm supposed to be on that camera? I don't, I don't know where it is, sorry. It uh, doesn't matter, I'm here. So <laughs> a lot of people classify cognition as things that are spatial, things that are related to sensory modalities, like um, vision, audition, those kinds of things. And then another one, frequently as part of cognition, is the structure and function, which I'll also demonstrate. And then, of course, we know that cognition is developmental, right? It's not hierarchically developmental. Some skills are, but not all skills. So let's talk about some of the principles that are um, pretty much understood by most researchers when it comes to cognition. And the first is we, and we're just using the word we as infants or whatever, we first learn things on our personal space, then peripersonal. So personal, I know my nose, my eyes, my ears, my peripersonal is beyond my arm's reach, and extra personal is beyond anything that I can reach, right? So uh, extra personal is that person standing in the back of the room, or many of you sitting in the audience are extra personal to me, right? Um, the other concept associated with cognition, and this is kind of a new idea, is the idea of interoception, right? You first know your body because you know the inside of your body. You know when you need to use the bathroom, you know when you're hungry, you know when you're cold, you know lots of things about the internal organs of your body, and so a baby first learns who they are by the interoception that's within their body. Right? So they know they're hungry, they reflexively suck, and so they learn to feed themselves. So that's one other. The other is this idea of structure and function. Well, you know, you have to have structure before you have function. If you don't have eyes, you don't have vision. Right? So structure and function, let's think about the eye, for instance. So structure means the health of the eye, the ability to see, uh, contrast sensitivity, refraction, meaning 20, 20, 20, 40. But the function of the eye is ocular motor skills. So that's what the eye does. Yes, it sees, but the eye also moves. And um, the sequence with which it moves, and this is hierarchical, is visual fixation. The ability to look at something 10 inches away from you or maybe that's 18 centimeters, I think. But anyway, at birth, the baby is able to see the mother's face from where they're breastfeeding. So that's the best and first visual skill that an infant has. As they develop, their visual fixation becomes at different places. And then the second visual skill that an uh, infant learns is what's called saccades or saccadic eye movement, one stationary object to the second. Recall? I said you have to have stability before mobility. So stability, fixation, another stability is looking at a stable object. And then finally, the third skill that develops is smooth pursuits. Some people call it tracking, but what the eye does is a smooth pursuit. That does not occur until you have the ability to have um, trunk control, head control, and eye control. So if you think about developmentally in that regard, a um, child under the age of seven, you ask them to follow a moving target, they're going to use their whole body because they don't have that isolated eye movement. A child from seven to 14 is going to use their head. They can hold their body still, but they need their head to move. They don't have that good of control of their eyes. At the age of 14 and above, they use only their eyes, right? They can follow a moving object just using their eyes. And of course, at 15 or 16, we give them keys to a car to drive at 70 miles an hour with that newfound skill they have. So that's what we mean by structure and function. So let's talk about some of the um, strategies, or not strategies, um, the um, theories, the, co the cognitive theories we've learned. We all know Piaget, right? That's what we all learned growing up. Um, so Piaget model is very, very linear, right? And it really talks about different skill sets. So the P 
Piaget would say, the first two years of life are sensory motor, right? And we know there's much more to it than that. So there, there's this whole other、uh, thought of what cognition is. And if you remember the name Gibson, remember Gibson was one of the first people to really talk about mobility, right? And she knew mobility based on this cognitive theory. So there are three different cognitive theories,、um, and she uses the word affordances. And what that means simply is, what opportunities does a person have, a child have, to be able to take in information? So there's grounded cognition, embodied cognition, and embedded cognition. We'll talk briefly about some of those. So grounded cognition is、um, how we learn something through simulations, meaning repeated. Opportunities at something.、Mm, a child in a power mobility device bumps into a wall. They learn once, and all it takes is one time to learn something. They bump into a wall. They learn that, and then they bump again and again and again. The more they use that simulated activity, the more they learn. So stopping children from doing things like bumping into walls and that sort of thing is not in the best interest of cognition.、Right? Then.、Um, The other concept about grounded cognition is it occurs during the experience. During the experience, which is why you do not need prerequisite skills to start power mobility training, because the power mobility training itself is what causes the the learning process, is what causes the cognition. So what we know so far in the past ten years is that、um, simulation. And bodily states play a very important role in cognition. Bodily states meaning things like posture, and、um, the opportunity to move in space. So whether I move this way in space, what I learned just became different. Let's say I l- learn move this way in space, my experience with these objects now become very different. Right. So moving in space and having opportunities is what. Allows cognition to be an ongoing process for life. This other one is kind of theoretical, but it's true: is、um, when we have perception.、Um, perception is so. Vision is sense is sensory input, right? You have sensory input before motor output. You have sensory input. Perception really is this idea of spatial relations, and perception. Is also part of cognition because you need to have perceptual understanding to have like three-dimensional things to know that there are twenty-four, five, six seats across the row. I just made that up. I don't know how many.、Um, the other part of cognition is memory, right? If you if you learn something today and you can't recall it tomorrow, did you really learn it? No, and that's why repetition is so critical. And I will say, kind of in the realm of infant mobility, if you put a child in a mobility device and say, "Let's see how well you do," they didn't do well, so they don't get a wheelchair. That is not learning. That is not cognition. You say, "Well, they don't have the cognitive skills." Well, no, they don't. Of course, they don't. They've never been in the power mobility device before. How would they have cognitive skills to 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 allow that to happen? So I'm not going to go through all the different types of. Cognition. I would if I had a, a bunch of hours, but I don't. The other thing about um, um, cognition is the ability to articulate or have language around something. So I can tell you, I can ask you. So what does a bird flying look like? So you you have, do you have a sense of what a bird flying would look like? Yes, because you've seen that. You have language around that. And it becomes part of、um, part of your cognitive makeup. You know how the wings are going to be positioned, how they're going to be flying. The other、um, concept associated with it is、um, when we read words, they put they hold a place in our brain,、um, and when it places it in our brain, just the word itself, hot. Okay, when you hear the word hot. If that's something of, of pleasure to you, the pleasure centers of your brain light up. If it's if you don't if you dislike hot, the place in your brain that says "ooh, don't like" 
that lights up. So the language is so directly tied to cognition. What does that mean with powered mobility? It means the use of language is critical. If you were to tell a six-month-old child who's using, learning to use a mobility device, push the yellow button, push the um, come to mommy, uh, whatever that is, that's not going to work because children do not follow commands until age one. Right? So power mobility needs to be play-based. But the other part is the use of language is critical. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So the other part of is understanding positions. If I tell you to think about what a calendar looks like, you know what a calendar looks like, right? You know we're one, two, three, four. You know it starts with Sunday, ends with Saturday. It's contextual. It's contextual in a visual framework. So if I t um, say next week, our Wednesday meeting was moved forward by two days. What day did it move forward to? Yes, if you're in a business model, yes. I know it took some of you a while to figure that out. Okay, I'll try another one. Our Monday meeting was moved forward by three days. Wednesday, right? So you can visualize that. It's an abstract thought, and it's based on the spatial relations. The other part of cognition, of course, is social, um, social cognition. When you smile, it does lots of things in your brain. When you smile to another person, they respond to that. So that's part of the cognitive processes. So let me talk about um, a model that's pro it's, um, it's not only specific to OT, but we, in the world of OT, kind of break cognition down into sensory modalities, right? So you have vision, which is input, cognition, which is throughput, perception, which is output. And then you have executive function. Executive function is a very large um, component of, of vision. So to start with, um, vision can be divided into visual integrity, visual efficiency, and visual information processing. This is also hierarchical. You must have visual um, integrity, meaning the health of your eye, which is structure, before you have visual efficiency, which is how you use your eyes, before you have visual information processing, how you compare things. So visual integrity just quickly is acuity, accommodation, eye health, and contrast sensitivity. Visual efficiency is how well we use our eyes. So we have things like accommodation, focusing our eyes on um, specific objects, binocular visual teaming, Ocular motor skills, fixations, saccades, and visual pursuits, which are hierarchical and must be gained in that order. Um, and the function of the eye then is, um, uh, as I said before, it's developmental. It doesn't reach full maturity until 14 years of age. So if we say that you have to have cognitive skills um, to use power mobility device with infants, then we would say, hmm, no child would be able to use a power mobility device until after age 14. Unless we believe and understand that the opportunity to use power mobility is what teaches cognition, which is the truth, and nothing but the truth. Um, again, it's hierarchical, it's linked to experience, and it is negatively impacted by prematurity. And it's negatively impacted by prematurity because the visual structures of the eye and, and the eye system are not fully developed until the third trimester. Which tells us if a child is born premature, they're gonna have visual efficiency problems, which means they're gonna need much, much more opportunities to use their vision, not just their visual acuity, but to use their visual ocular motor skills, their positioning is important, and um, that sort of thing. So this is what a lot of people think vision is. Is visual, I mean, a lot of people think cognition is, or part of it, is visual information processing. And it can be divided in visual spatial skills, visual analysis skills, and then finally visual motor integration. And this is what a lot of people think. Oh, well these are some of the things that, that you must have before you, have, before you can use power mobility. So visual spatial skills, and these again, 
well, just visual spatial skills are um, kind of n not necessarily hierarchical, but you need bilateral integration, right? Two hands coming together. An infant doesn't have handedness at least until the first year of life, and some even much later than that. So what would a, what would a joystick look like for an infant? It should be midline. It should be the ability to use two hands to use the joystick or whatever other device. And, and really, I am really specifically talking about pediatric power mobility and cognition. But these all still, uh, um, still apply to adults who have maybe have had a stroke or a brain injury or any of those things. So the other thing you have um, that's part of this is directionality. This is right, this is left, this is straight, this is up, this is down. So if you don't have visual fixation or in pursuits, these concepts don't make a lot of sense. So if you put a child in a power mobility device day one, and you say, what I'd like you to do is move, go straight, turn right, right? That is not a, a skill that a child has. And so if we say that they must have visual spatial skills to be able to do, drive a power mobility device, no, they don't. They'll learn those skills as they move around. So you have directionality, which is mean I know right and left on me. Laterality is I know right and left based on you. So I can say, oh, that's on your right side or that's on your left side. So you don't have laterality till you have directionality. And then of course the rest of these visual analysis, figure ground, visual closure, um, visual memory, and those type of things. So some people have said, well, you have to have object permanence to drive for an infant to drive a power mobility device. Do you see how many skills we've already gone through? Visual permanence is I know that something is outside that room. I know there's a water bottle or a, a, a case for water out there. That's, that's object permanence. And you see how many cognitive skills it takes to do that? I had to have seen it. I had to have picked it up. All of those things. I don't need that for power mobility. And then, of course, visual motor integration is fine motor and gross motor. Um, not really going to talk a whole lot about, um, yeah, I'm not going to talk a lot about visual spatial skills. It's basically where things are in association, in association with you. A child who's never moved from here to here does not know that that's one foot or meters or whatever. I don't know that this table it has a hard surface until I bump into it, right? To me, it's two-dimensional. Until you interact with the world in the three-dimensional way, everything's two-dimensional. So if I say, well, hmm, what color is Venus? And how big is Venus? What's the shape of it? What's the temperature of it? Unless you're really smart in that field, you don't know because you've never been there. But if you went there once, you would figure it out, right? So that's what visual spatial skills are, is you understanding your environment in relationship to yourself. So you have to understand yourself. Here's my hands, here's my feet, here's, before you get, get to any of these skills. So cognition, this is cognition in many ways. It starts with alertness and arousal, which is are you able to attend to something? So if you think about a person with a traumatic brain injury um, and they're in a comatose state, that's the first thing you, that's, that's stage one of cognition. Can that person be aroused? Can they be awake? The next is attention. Can you pay attention? How long can you pay attention? Can you disregard other things that you don't need to pay attention to? Then the next is orientation, as we all know, that's person, place, circumstance. And so if you don't have arousal, you can't have orientation. If you don't have orientation, you can't have memory, places to store this information. You store the information because you have a visual representation of where it is. You have a tactile or what we call haptic perception of what this object is. I know that this is solid. I know it's firm, right? I store that information, not just the size of it, but I store all of that information in my head somewhere between my ears. Then after that is new learning. New learning is putting a child in a power mobility device for the first time. You see how many cognitive skills occur before that, right? So if you're saying you have to have cognition 
meaning this, before you can use a power mobility device. Nope, you have to have visual skills because everything starts with intake, input. Problem solving is another one of those things people say, well, they have to have problem solving. You don't have problem solving until you have cause and effect. You don't have cause and effect until you, app, you operate on your environment or operate within your environment. So problem solving is not, does, do you need problem solving to use a power mobility device? Absolutely not. It, the power mobility device will teach you problem solving. I push a joystick, the joystick moves, I hit a wall. I need to back up, I back up. That's problem solving, right? And it's taught through the use of self-initiated mobility. The key about self-initiated mobility is it taps into this whole other system which we call the volition system, right? Which is where the reticular, this might be a little like blah, 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 the, the reticular activating system allows us to be alert. It means our head has to be held up here. Our reticular activating system is like a mercury switch. When we turn the merc when we tilt our head at 30 degrees, the mercury switch goes off. The child is not aroused. So if you don't have arousal, you, it's really difficult to have these other skills. So trying to keep the head upright, positioning the child well enough, helps learning. That doesn't mean they have to have it for learning. It just means it optimizes learning. Um, and then finally, executive function. Um, I'm going to skip this one because we've already kind of talked about attention. Um, and then, I'll then we'll go back to executive function. Okay, so if we believe attention is necessary for power mobility device, I want to do a test and see if any of you are ready for power mobility. The next slide is a slide of words with colors. What I want you to do is say the color, not the word. Ready? One, two, three. Color? That's kind of slow. <laughs> say you have delayed cognition. I, I say you shouldn't be driving. Right? Now you should be able to reverse it really quickly and say, now I want you to read the word. Much quicker. Okay. So that's attention, knowing what to pay what, what to attend to. This is called the Stroop test. And if you know what to attend to and can do it quickly, that's attention, right? Is being able to change those things. Memory is um, probably something we all know. These are just, a you know, a breakdown of what memory is. You've got long-term memory, short-term memory, memory for events, memory for um, um, knowledge. Who's first president? Uh, well, that's not a fair question. Um, what color is the sky, right? I was going to say, who's the president of the United States? And some of you would be like, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> okay, executive function is the highest level of cognition. It occurs in the frontal lobe, which means people who have had traumatic brain injuries, this is probably their, their most problematic aspect of, power, of um, learning, right? And these are the executive, um, uh, executive functioning skills. Starts with monitoring self-awareness, again, Personal, peripersonal, extrapersonal. Awareness, again, back to this um, interoception. I am aware that I'm hungry. I am aware that I like this food. So it, what do you, in your body, what are you aware of? Then the next is, and, and this is, again, is not hierarchical, but you do have to have awareness before others. So the other parts of executive function, the management of time, mental flexibility, organizing and planning, goal setting, initiation, response inhibition, like I'm not going to do this, I am going to do this, and problem solving. And problem solving at this level is more abstract. If you were driving here today and you had a flat tire on, I don't know what the name of the interstate is here, 379 maybe, you had a flat tire on the interstate and you were presenting at 8 o'clock and it was 759. No, let's say you're, you're better with time management than that. It was 7.30, right? At 7.30, so what are you going to do? How are you going to solve that problem? Are you going to keep driving the car with flat tire? Are you going to call Uber? Are you going to walk? Are you going to call somebody else you know? That's problem solving. That's mental flexibility. Do you have the skills necessary for doing that? So let's talk a bit about, let's see how our time is doing. Good. Um, about development. So as I said before, infants are born with reflexes. 
And it's the reflex that when acted upon frequently leads to the integration of that reflex, takes, this, takes it from a reflex to a skill. Right? As I said before, you put something in a baby's hand, that's palmer grasp. It, that's, an, that's, a, um, that's a reflex. If you continue to put different things in the baby's hand, I'm going to use this both. <laughs> put different things in the baby's hand, they develop hand skills. That is skill. Starts with a reflex and moves to a skill. The more I put an object into the baby's hand, the more that skill develops, right? <clears throat> so that's what development is, is, is the, um, the um, the interaction between vision, cognition, perception in a sequential way, right? Giving a child opportunities to use those skills in different environments. If you keep a child... Oh, I had a student... Um, this is going somewhere. My students always say, Dr. Plummer, no more tangents. Stop. Just do the lecture and let us get out of here. So I had a student one time who did his capstone in Haiti. And what he did was he went, uh, there's a new OT and PT school that I was teaching at remotely. He went down there and he gave all of the students, all six of them, cameras, disposable cameras to take pictures of what do you think children look, or what do you think children see in their environment? And so he did and had great pictures. One picture stood out more than any other. And he, that one of the students took a picture of a ceiling fan a partial ceiling fan that wasn't working, tilted on its side in black and white, and said, this 10-year-old child has never seen anything but this. Right? Environmental deprivation. So if we just leave children in the same environment, we leave them in their uh, static positioning device, that's all they're going to learn. So when people say, well, they, you know, they need a manual chair, or they need this, they need that. Well, if that's all they have... That's all they learn, right? So having lots of opportunities in different environments to take that one skill that started as a reflex, take that one skill and apply it in different environments. That's learning. That's cognition, right? Um, let's, so, again, it, learning occurs by exploration. And this is just a quote from uh, an article that's a great article by Lobo and Galloway. Um, Developmental skills don't just occur. They occur because of exploration, an enriched environment, and intentional opportunities to act on the environment. Whether it's a ball, or it's a stick, or it's a, uh, something that turns and spins. And we know that if children have prematurity, or if children uh, are in the need of, well, of course all kids are in the need of development, but if we know that development is our, our focus, the more opportunities they have in different environments helps. So um, Lobo and Galloway did a study on um, advanced handling or enhanced handling. And so they worked with these caregivers and taught them ways to hold the child, position the child, play with the child, and found that those children that had advanced opportunities um, caught up to their developmental milestones. Right? So for those of you that are therapists, therapy works. Right? <laughs> so the more a child has opportunities to use a skill in multiple environments, the better they can generalize that skill, the better they can take that skill and refine it. So it's about exploration. It's not about mobility. So if you say, if you're doing a test of a child um, in a mobility device, and you say, hmm, I want you to follow this straight line, or I want you to go to the door, or I want you to go to mama, whatever, that's not exploration. That's not learning. That's not, that's not going to happen, because giving a child a command is not learning. Right? Because for the most part, they don't even know the language. And then secondly, there's no volition to it. There's no, I want, therefore I do. Which is what I was saying about the reticular activating system closing down. Is when a child doesn't want to do something, they turn their head down. And their arousal level de demo, um, decreases. Um, 
Okay, that's as much as I want to talk about there. The other part of co cognition is cognition occurs through different postures. I can learn something, and there are many, many studies that illustrate this. If I'm in a seated position, I learn, oh, I might not be able to get back up. I learn this. If I'm in a standing position, I learn this. If I'm in a supine position, I learn the ceiling fan. So the more opportunities for different postures and changes of posture, the more the visual perceptual system is fed and develops into a wide array of information associated with it. It starts with, uh, I would say, doesn't necessarily start. It is at its peak at two months of age when a baby is prone on forearms, able to hold their head up because prone on forearms facilitates the erectospinal muscles of the thoracic spine and the head and puts the head where the vestibular and visual system are working together. And if the visual and vestibular system don't work together, there's not much integration of knowledge. So what does that mean? If a child is stationary, the vestibular system is not, not tapped in. A child is moving. If you, if you ever put a um, child into a power mobility device, the first thing they do is spin, spin, spin. What they're doing is making up for the lost time of their vestibular system. Once they kind of like, okay, I know where those rocks in my head are, and I know that I better stop because I'm going to get dizzy, and yeah, now I know where I am in space. It's not, uh, so that's exactly what happens is you, ha you need to have the visual and vestibular system both linked together in order to have cognition skills be, um, be integrated. Crawling, is, as we know, the, the reason crawling is so, so important, whether it's crawling or self-initiated mobility or locomotion, is a child is acting on their own to be able to decide where they want to go. I want to go here, I'm going to crawl there. I see a toy, and this is how it, how it occurs developmentally, is at six months of age, a child is able to sit, their visual system is peripersonal, it, six to seven months, their visual system becomes extra personal, beyond arm's reach. So they're sitting there looking at something, they see something in their extra personal space, they reach out to try to find it, they fall over. And they're like, huh, that wasn't so bad, I'll scoot over, but I get it, I pick it up and I have it. Right? That's how crawling occurs, it starts with a visual system, visually fixating on, on an object out in front of them. So that exploration of being able to move where a child wants to move based on their interest is a cognitive skill. And that cognitive skill needs to be repeated over uh, long periods of time. Um, we also know that movement is linked to vision. A term that's, that you may not be aware of is this term visual proprioception. It is where um, self-produced mobility is kind of complicated to explain. But let me try. So we have two different optic streams, right? We have the information that comes in from the periphery and information that comes in through central vision. If a child has a static headrest and that static headrest stays like this and it extends here, they're not learning peripheral vision. They're not learning to turn their head. So if possible, headrest should be really limited or at least, and again, I'm not talking product, or at least be able to turn their head side to side. Right? So it is what's called propri uh, proprioception. We know that locomotion is very much a part of uh, cognition. That's when a child does what we call visual foraging, right? I see something, hmm, I don't want that. Huh. Oh, I want that. That only happens if a child is able to move freely in space. And so if they're restrained and in a tilt and space system, visual foraging is, I want that light or that one. No, none of them are very interesting. I don't want any of them. So it's um, helpful to do that. So I think another takeaway point I'd like for you to hear is that powered mobility is an intervention that gives children the opportunity for self-initiated mobility or self-initiated movement and allows independent exploration and negotiation in their environment. That's cognition. 
is for a child to have self-initiated mobility in an environment that offers them novel experiences. Right? That's how it occurs for the children who are unable to mobilize on their own. It's not putting them in a stroller and pushing. Passive movement does not elicit volition. It doesn't elicit, uh, so when a child is in a power, um, uh, stroller, they go into what's called visual idle because it's the same position, their body's in the same position, their eyes are in the same position, whatever the position is, and they don't have that. Um, this other t concept I talked about is embodied cognition. It means that when the body interacts with the environment, learning occurs. So that's another, um, another thought about that. So there were two people, James and, I forget her name, Gibson, if you remember from back in the early 1980s, they were the ones that said infants should have opportunities for independent mobility. 1980, 90, 2000, 20, 30, 40 years ago, I needed my fingers. Um, is 40 years ago, they had this concept of embodied cognition, where they said what we learn is based on the environment and the opportunity to move through the environment, and those that um, is how people learn about the world is because they are a person in the environment. We also know that time is a critical element in terms of learning and development. Um, um, I don't want to talk much more about that because I want to get into this. So Eleanor Gibson, that's the one. So Eleanor Gibson was the per one of the first people that ever talked about power mobility for infants. Um, did studies on it. She was like the progenitor of power mobility for in infants and children. She says also that children learn, cognition occurs when children have an opportunity to uh, be present in their environment and to explore their environment. So the acquisition of sitting, crawling, all of those other skills develop and develop within a context of an environment. They don't develop independent of environment. So the more enriched the environment is, the more opportunity for cognition. Playing outside is different than playing inside. You've got blue skies, at least today. Um, and so having different environments, different people around, is what cognition is and, and cognitive learning is about. Um, as we said before, the environment is part of the cognitive um, system. It's the interaction of the mind, the world, and um, meaningful activities, right? Meaningful analysis of things. So if the child is always in a classroom, in a certain space, that's what they learn. Um, if you have never been to Pittsburgh, you didn't realize Pittsburgh had so many tall buildings and beautiful architect, but now you do, right? Because you had a, the experience of it. You had an opportunity to explore it. Now you learn something. You don't learn if you've never left your home in some remote place. So cognition, we, the reason we have cognition is for action. It's to guide us into um, the, the opportunities to be involved in appropriate situation, appropriate activities. Right? That uh, if a child is on a playground and they see something of interest, this, the situational opportunity they have is, I want to go play with that, I'm going to go play with that. I'm going to make the decision. It might take me three or four times. I might not get there the first time. I might bump into some things, but I want that. I want, I want, I get. Right? Um, so when, uh, this is what we talked about with offline cognition, when you're disassociated from the environment, um, there, uh, there are still sensory processes occurring. So just because you, um, just because a child went to a novel environment, was taken from that novel environment, that experience continues to play in their brain. You can't take that away from them. Right? So, so allowing children to have lots of opportunities to move around in space, lots of opportunities to have different environments, when they go away, they, that still plays in their head. What does that mean? 
lots of opportunities create lots of brain memories, and memories are what creates opportunities for new activities. So let's say that the child was playing with a ball, and this is the first time they ever did it. They threw the ball, they saw what the ball does. A week later, they see a ball in the distance. They're like, oh, I remember that. That's cognition, right? That's, that's how they, they learn that. They learn that there's, there's the ball, that's what I want to play with. Um, so this is another quote by, that was done um, quite a long time ago by Tefton, Jurette, and Furumasu. Um, their comment was that training in the use of power mobility is typically required before a child can, can demonstrate cognitive experience or cognitive re readiness. Must have opportunities to use a device before they have cognition because cognition is tied to experience. Cognition is tied to environment. You're not going to put an infant into a powered mobility device and see success. It's not going to happen. And so if we say they have to have this skill and this skill and this skill before I think they're ready for powered mobility, theoretically, that's not true. Theoretically, they, they ha there are no prerequisite skills, not even vision, right? Vision is helpful, but children, blind children, can learn to navigate their environment by different sensory information. So let's say you do have a child with visual impairments and you're trying to teach them spatial awareness. You, you substitute vision for another sensory modality. You put bubble wrap on the sides of the hallway or uh, round things you don't want them to hit. And so when they roll over the bubble wrap, they hear pop, 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 pop. You're like, no, 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 no. Come back here. Or pop, stay away from pop pops. Not pop pops, the daddy, but pop pops, the Pop pops, right? The bubble wrap. Right, Dr. Brian? <laughs> she, she and I worked in a clinic together and I did that all the time and she was frightened by it a few times because the curtain was drawn between us. All of a sudden you hear pop pop. Okay, powered mobility should be added. And this is another quote by Butler in 1984. So people that have, have taught us these things that we, in some cases, I feel like we have forgotten. Powered mobility should be part of early rehab because it's approximation to normal gross motor normal movement right it's not walking it's not crawling but if the child doesn't move in space independently volitionally they don't learn it's fact right so if if, if we can augment mobility even if we think that child's going to be able to walk when they're three children with down syndrome for instance um, I did a study where I looked at very young children for the, um, admittedly for the FDA, and um, put children who had never been in mobility devices to see how they would react. Children with Down syndrome did amazing, even though they had never moved about in space by themselves. They, they were never able to sit up totally independently. They were able to, to do, to move the device, right? So I'm not just saying everybody always needs a power mobility device as an infant, but if you know that this child with cerebral palsy is maybe, probably, going to walk when they're six. The first six years of life are the most critical years. If we're not using augmented mobility for children to learn and we wait till age six, what happens with all those cognitive skills? Do you think developmental disabilities are linked to motor impairments? Is it possible to think that if we had children, if we gave children access to mobility devices at a very young age, that we could prevent developmental disabilities? I do. Theoretically, it's true. We, we don't have proof of it yet, but theoretically, if we supplement self-initiated mobility of crawling, walking, sitting, and give them opportunities for self-exploration and interaction with the environment and interaction with other children and volitional choice, wouldn't, doesn't it make sense that these skills would still develop? Right? And wouldn't it be great if we could prevent developmental disabilities or at least um, teach some of the skills associated with it? I don't know that we could change it totally, but I would like to believe so. Right? I would like to believe that cognition 
as we know cogn how cognition occurs, that couldn't, if we, if we truly know and understand how cognition occurs based on these models, that we could teach children to do things that they never could do without the mobility device. So just real quickly, um, um, I, I want to introduce something that some of you may, may or may not know. So in 2020, after a mobility device became available, the Explorer Mini, which I helped do some of the FDA testing for, um, three of us, Heather Feldner, myself, and um, Allison Hendry, who's a speech-language pathologist, um, discovered, mostly Heather and myself discovered, like, hmm, you know what we don't have is a good way of teaching infants and children how to use mobility device. One, because we've never had a mobility device. Two, because we don't know, right? So what we did was, um, and some of you in this room I know have been part of this study, we reached out to inter international experts in the, in the field of pediatric mobility. And we said, um, we had lots of questions for them. Like, what do you believe is necessary? What, how would you teach a child? What domains would you be working on? And so over a period of two years, we compiled all that information. We read 170 research articles in fields that are not just OT and PT, but fields in psychology, optometry, developmental psychology, lots of things, and created a guide to how to teach infants and children power, power mobility. It's not published because it's 170 pages, and frankly, nobody would publish it because it's so long. But it is available on Permabil's website. Um, you may go to their website, or better yet, I have an idea, come to the session at 1.30 this afternoon, where we actually use the Power Mo the Explorer Mini to work with young children. Scott, where's our room? Do you know? It's session 44, but it's an hour session on using this guide to teach infants and children how to use mobility device to gain cognitive skills, not and to and to teach them how to interact and not how how to move a device. Um, so some of the ability considerations we did learn is there are no prerequisite skills. And this was based on, again, the input of 40 international experts. Did you find the room? 3, 306. So if you want to know more about uh, putting this into practice, um, 306 is the room. So again, we found that there are no ability, there are no prerequisites, that the, mo the first emerging practice field, uh, practice area is, or the not practice area. The first emerging skill is some trunk control, not that they have to have it, visual fixation, head control, and joint attention or shared attention. So those are just some things we test, uh, or we suggest, be tested to see where is this child, and then where is this child a month later, or two months later. So that's that. Um, I'm gonna skip, uh, uh, I'm gonna skip all of it, I guess. Uh, I'm not gonna skip this one because I have much more references, but I didn't include them. So what, what, so people ask, so what, what really is shared attention and joint attention? Thanks, five minutes. Shared attention and joint attention is when two people can get together and say, here's this and here's that. Joint attention is mom looks at this and says, honey, look over here at this object. So the child can be looking at their toy and turn over. That joint attention is a cognitive skill, it's a visual skill that helps um, cognitive processes begin and it also is one of the foundational things for social skills. I'm going to leave that picture up while we finish up. Questions? Comments? I know we're, I'm in the way of lunch, so I understand. Question? Does this work? Is that it's working? A, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, great presentation and oh, really thanks, like yeah. the whole, you know, attention to visual and cognition. And I guess, I don't know what happens here, but when we are applying for funding of a power mobility device, we have to demonstrate that there's been some, like those emerging skills mm -hmm. and improvement. And often the early assessments um, that are skills-based aren't appropriate. Do you, uh. do you use the ALP? Have you... 
No. Um, what, um, and Scott and I will talk about this this afternoon when we present. We use a tool that's called the CREDI, Caregiver Reported Early Development Inventory. And what it does is look at developmental milestones. And because it's not skill-based, it's development-based. And so when you're thinking about really young, young children, um, their skill in using a power mobility device is not there. But what is, is what reflex, what's the reflex they have now, what, where are they gaining? And um, so that's a, a, we found a very useful tool. And it's, um, well, we'll talk about it this afternoon if you want to come to that. If not, I'll catch up with you later, Deb. So I work with adults, and they have not had those early opportunities at this <laughs> stage of the game. Uh -huh. Are you doing anything, or is anyone looking at the ability for the adult population with developmental disabilities being able to gain those skills and improve their learning and uh, not, cognition? Not that I'm aware of, but um, this is, again, theoretical. And so theories transverse um, populations. So if you're looking at uh, skills and skill sets, um, and you provide opportunities for an enriched environment, you look at, in, for some cases, limiting the amount of information in a room, allow self-exploration. That's the key, is self-exploration. And activity-based or play-based, not put them in a chair and see if they can follow a straight line or follow commands. Because if they do have cognitive impairments, again, cognition is not required for power mobility. What is required for power mobility is opportunities to learn and experience environments in increasingly complex areas. So I would, I would theorize that these same things would apply to adults because they apply to people with traumatic brain injuries, to, to CVA, to all of those things. So I'd be interested in hearing if somebody has done that. Um, I have not, and I have a job as a teacher. So I've been, yeah, yeah, good. Go ahead, yes. A little bit of a repeat, but adding on to that, I work with individuals with ABI. I'm curious if you have thoughts on either amount of time to attempt self-exploration before we say this is not working and or any sort of tools you are aware of in the educational world to be able to quantify like this is working, this is not. I'm so what, what population did you say? Primarily with people with uh, acquired brain injury. Adults. Oh, uh, ABI, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but if you think about their cognitive skills, it's very, very similar to the cognitive skills we're working on. Um, I think that's a clinician's call. Like, you know the individual, you know the context. It's uh, not just, there's not just a, a yes, it works, yes, it doesn't. It is very situational. So I'm sorry I can't really comment on that except to say theoretically, if you follow some of the guidelines associated with vision, cognition, perception, and really concentrate. And I have worked with individuals with CP, and kids with CP frequently have monocular vision because of the way they, uh, because of plagiocephaly. And so they see if one way you might be able to tell, especially with the ABI population, is which eye is in the center of the body. And the eye that's in the center of the body is their monocular, is their primary eye. So if they're struggling with navigating, put a patch over that eye that's weak, and you'll see much improvement. Because uh, uh, cranial nerve three, four, six are most affected by brain injuries, and so they probably do have visual ocular motor problems. But it would be a good place to try. Hello. Um, I'm an OT student and working with um, a manual wheelchair skills program, so I've loved this because we're going to be um, hopefully moving in the power mobility direction soon. Good. Um, one thing is a lot of parents express fear around, like, the skill learning process with the manual wheelchairs, which I'm sure is even more the case with the power mobility. So how do you kind of navigate that barrier of like parents' fear with the safety component? Um, actually, I would um, suggest you talk to Scott. Okay. Scott, can you raise your hand? And not necessarily now because we just have one minute, but he can give you some great information because that's what he's been doing for the last couple months. Thank you. Question here. Um, my name is Dan. I work with an adult population and patient rehab facility. And, and kind of to piggyback off that question is safety is a huge concern, right, of doing power mobility with people with impaired cognition. I'd love to bring this back to my facility, but I know that's going to be the first barrier yep. that's addressed. And I was wondering if we could steal ideas from the pediatric world to help keep these 
people safe, if you have any ideas on that. Um, if you can gain access to this um, guide that I'm talking about, it has a whole section on safety and some things you can do to, to make the environment safe and then gradually introduce things that are less safe, like something that you can bump into that's not going to hurt the person. Because that's what teaches the problem solving and cause and effect. Because it's not, safety is always going to be a concern, but the person's response to an unsafe situation is going to be the learning that occurs. Thank you. Okay. But, um, last question. Uh, it's more just there is a tool that um, has been validated for people with learning disability mm -hmm. and very young. It's the assessment of learning of power of mobility. So it's more a process based assessment tool um, starting at the really novice level and it has training strategies as well. So and that's Elizabeth it's Nelson. Nelson. Yeah, yeah Elizabeth Nelson and Durkin. Um, so that's not skills based, it's more looking at where is the person at in their learning process yeah. and how can you facilitate them moving up. Yeah, and that's a very, very good tool, Ab absolutely. Um, so I think we're out of time. I really appreciate your attentiveness and your questions. Um, it's always a pleasure to present.